every word that will come, let it not be fabricated in the mind of a man. Let it be breathed. Let it be conceived in your heart. The heart that was pierced with the last. Let the blood and the water that comes empower your words. Lord, speak it forth with power. And grant grace for understanding. As you sit before you, O God, may every man, woman, boy, or girl that come never remain the same. In the name of Jesus. We lighten up this conference by the power in your name. We ask that the light of heaven be focused in this arena. From now on, Lord, we all will sit. We will operate under the fullness of your light. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, as you answer these prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. I want to appreciate and sit down the chaplain and the act of season leadership for this privilege they have granted us to see God talk to us this evening. I thank all of you also for your coming. We are trusting God that he will show us in a better way what he has called us to see. The topic for the prayer meeting today is, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. But I prefer it in our closer English language, Behold, the bridegroom comes. And I'm already in the book of Matthew chapter 25. I will be reading from verse 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be lacking to ten virgins who took their lamp and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise one took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slobbered and slept. And at the midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamp. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamp are going out. But the wise one answered, saying, No, lest there should be not let there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready waiting with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you, do, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. In the name of Jesus. That amen was not good. I say in the name of Jesus now. I am talking about a topic that is titled, Behold, the bridegroom comes. 
Behold, the bridegroom comes. It's a message of reawakening. It's a message that is meant to arouse us, assuming we have slobbered and slept in the court of living our Christian life. It is a message of rebirth that should fire in our bones adequate revival that is needed of this end time church so that when the master come, our heads will not be bowed in shame. It is a passage that is meant to reawaken us at this time where it appears that Christians are distracted by so many things. The first thing I will say about this message of reawakening is that it is a message that will make us see this matter again with our eyes. Because it is what you see that you will enter. Behold, the bridegroom comes. It's a message that is made by God to come our way this time so that again we will see this matter with our eyes. Because experience has shown that it is what a man has seen that he can possess or enter. If that day will not take us on our way, if that day will not make us bow our heads in shape, God is merciful this evening to make us see this matter again. In John chapter 3, as Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said to him in verse 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can I, a grown-up man, be going again into my mother's womb to be born? Jesus re-emphasized and said, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The first thing I want to say this evening is that I notice. That it is the kingdom that you have seen that you can enter. If a man has not seen it clearly or understand it well, I noted that in Christianity today, one of the troubles that we have in our day's Christianity is not that God has changed. It is that ignorance has taken the place of knowledge, even in the house of God. Jesus needed to tell Nicodemus that you need to see this matter first before you enter. Many a times they say Christians who want to get answers delivered to them. They want to enter into the kingdom and the rest of God. But as we see them from, from a close reach, we noted that they have not seen this matter at all. And our God in his mercy He's bringing in a gate that we see it. Why? Because to behold simply means to perceive with your visual faculty. The next thing I want to say about this topic is that it is a topic, a call of reawakening that the Lord is bringing across our way this time so that beyond seeing it with our eyes, we will also understand and perceive this matter with our minds. As I look at the meaning of behold, it means not just to perceive. It also means to concentrate your heart on. It became clear to me that a man can be looking at something and then he's not seeing it. He's not perceiving it. Sometimes when we talk to our children, are you not looking at me? It's not that the eyes of the baby is not on you, but that the mind is not there. So as we look at the scripture, we saw in the book of Matthew 13, 13, 
that Jesus said from the Good News Bible that the people will look and look. I don't know why they interpreted it like that. But he said they will not see anything because their heart is dull. I noted clearly that there is a connection between the sighted power of any man and the state of the mind. When you look and then your heart is not there and your mind has not conceived it, I am afraid that you may not get the matter clearly. So he said they will look. Actually, there are men sitting before us that have seen this matter that Jesus will come again. I know as we sit here and as you hear my voice, you cannot tell me that you have not heard that Jesus will not come again. If you didn't hear it from the television, you have heard it from the radio. If you didn't hear it from the radio, you have heard it from Father's mouth. If you did not hear it from there, maybe people of other religion, like Muslims, need that to remind you that Jesus will come again. But I see that beyond just seeing it, it appears that we have not fully got to the third place, the state where we will actually understand. No wonder the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3 11 that God has set eternity in the heart of men, yet they cannot fathom out what God has done from beginning to the end. We all know that eternity is real. We all know that the bridegroom will come. You cannot shy away from it. The Lord in his message is saying, Paravetra, you have heard, but your mind is not there. That this message will come again, that the bridegroom will come. And the third thing I want to say about this message is that God is allowing this message to reach us so that we can see this matter clearly. Because it is not everything you see that is clear. We can see it closely. We can see it openly. Because one of the many of the behold is to see something that is not clear, something that is in a distant level, something that is hidden by looking at it with attention. It becomes clear to me, brethren, that God wants us again to see this matter clearly, openly, and not closely. As I read through the scripture in Mark chapter. 8, from verse 22 to 25, I noted that Jesus is in the habit of not leaving men to see things in an unclear matter. The Bible says, and they brought him a man who was blind from birth at Baxada. They said, Master, call this man to see. And he brought the man out and with his feet to minister to the man. The Bible says, this all needed to ask. Say, young man, what do you see? And he said, I see men, but they are walking like trees. Jesus knew there was a trouble. Because this man will go plucking mango from the head of men. Did you get what I just said? He will pluck guava from the head of men. Jesus needed to touch this man again. So that the man will see this matter clearly. He will see it closely. Paravetro, you have seen this matter. And you have been concentrating on it. The reason why God is bringing it again is that you need to look again to see it closely. This is not a matter that somebody will describe to you. It's not a matter that somebody will tell the story to you. Because it concerns you. In Jeremiah 1 verse 12, the Bible says, and when God called Jeremiah, he brought him somewhere and said, Jeremiah, 
What do you see? Jeremiah said, I see an armor tree. He said, you see well. It appears that our father in his love wants us to see this matter well again. Will you help me tell your neighbor that God is talking to you this evening? Can you tell your neighbor? Say, neighbor, it is you God is talking to this evening. God is not here to present this matter to a crowd. In his mercy, he wants to show it to you personally as he's showing it to me personally. Because the matter we are looking at concerns all of us. I have come to realize that the world that we live in today can distract a man. The world that we are in can distract a man from this each matter, from matters and issues that relate to your souls. In Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says, It is not as if the gospel we preach is veiled. But that the God of this present age, hear me, sir, there is something about this age that can make a man not see what will benefit your hereafter. I notice by my own experience that the world is not in the habit of pointing us to what will happen tomorrow. The world is busy pointing us to now. Have you noticed, sir? Now, what is raining now is comedy. They are telling you, come, laugh, and die. Nothing will happen tomorrow. But let me tell your neighbor, there is a tomorrow. You didn't say it was a neighbor? Say, there is a tomorrow. They don't notice that one of the, the professors that is raining now is event manager. They are telling us, sister, celebrate. Whereas there is no cause to celebrate. I wait God will show you his clock. And you will know that we are already in injury time. As father was talking, he said, eternity has started long ago. And one thing rang in my heart, I said, where are we now? Where are we? A man of God has been praying about eternity. And one day he went to the sleep, and he saw a man standing on top of an upstairs with a balcony. And there's a very big clock behind him. And he said, in front of the man were all kinds of people who were busy doing their business. The man was trying to attract attention, but nobody was giving him attention. He stayed there and stayed there and looked at the time. He turned back and shook his head. As he looked at the time, he discovered that it was a minute to twelve. So he went there and used his hand and brought the minute hand to quarter to twelve. We are in the injury time. The one may tell us, excuse me, there's no problem. Why is it that the world is pointing us to nudity, nakedness? They say, see, pleasure, be happy. There is nothing that will happen. But I bet you, sir, God cannot start a generation that is not taken somewhere. Did you hear what I just said? God cannot start a generation, a world that does not have a timetable to take somewhere. There is a God that can blind men about sensitive issues like this that we benefit them. Thank God for the archdiocese that they are telling us again we need to live for eternity. We are talking about the hood, the bridegroom coming. When Jesus described this word in Luke eleven twenty nine, he called it a wicked generation. We are living in a wicked world. We are living in a world which titles to, from verse 11 to 14, describe as this present age. There is something about this age that you need to be careful about. Because as I look at it, I noted that this age can blind a man from your tomorrow. Can I say it again? Christianity gives us tomorrow. And we are not just to look at today. People can perform all kinds of miracles and wonders to tell you the word end here. The Bible says, if our belief in Christ is all about this present age, it's of all men, we are most miserable. There is a tomorrow. And God is saying, please look at this matter again so that you will put in more strength to begin to look at it. Hear me, sir? 
Jesus is the bridegroom we are expecting. As we read the book of John 3, 22 to 25, John the Baptist said of Jesus, when they told him that there is a man who is somewhere there baptizing, he said to them, the bride is meant for the bridegroom. The bridegroom can re- the bridegroom's friend can rejoice with the bridegroom, but he does not own the bride. He refers to Jesus as the bridegroom we are expecting. In case you don't know, if we say the bridegroom is coming, we are simply saying Jesus, who came before and has gone back, is coming again. I know messages like this, they are not very popular again in the pulpit. I will not be surprised that after this night, some of us will not continue. I went to St. Martin, so I said they will be uh, dedicated to preach on the danger of sexual immorality to Catholic Catholic organization. I noted that as I was preaching, 15 youth left the church angrily. They would get out and say, my friend, get get out of here. What are they saying? I won't be surprised if some of you didn't come tomorrow. Because messages that are popular now is that you will not die. Please, now you and me tell your neighbor you will die one day. People didn't say to say neighbor, you will die on the day God has said for you. Did you hear me now? Did you hear me now? And when Jesus was talking about himself, he also called himself the bridegroom. In Matthew chapter 9, 14 to 15, he said, Jesus, the people came to him and said, why is it that John's disciples are fasting and your people are not fasting? He told them, do you suffer the guests to fast and to mourn when the bridegroom is with them? He said, a time will come when he will be taken away, then they will fast. The implication of this was that I am the bridegroom. And as far as I am around, my people does not need to fast. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 22, drove up this message well when he talked about the mystery of marriage. You remember that popular verse that he said, Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord. He said, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. If Paul is talking about husband and wife, and he's bringing the analogy of Jesus and the church, don't you think that Jesus is the bridegroom? But you are not talking now. Amen. He said, as Christ loved the church, he said he did it by washing the church with water of the word, so that he can present her to himself, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, but a church in what? Without fault. He says, so husband ought to love their wife. I don't want to go there. But as he rounded that matter up, he said, this is a profound mystery, and I am talking about Christ and the church. Our bridegroom that God is presenting to us today is no other person that Jesus. Jesus is coming and the Lord is saying to us we need to see it again. The Lord is saying to us we need to look at it. And what is it coming to do? It's coming for a marriage. Because where we read said the bridegroom was having a wedding banquet. In Revelation 19 verse 7 to 8 the Bible says let us rejoice and be glad for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And the bride has made herself ready. She now said, She was giving linen that I want and fine to wear. And when he was bringing that matter close, he said, For the fine linen represents the good deeds of the saints. I discover that Jesus is coming to be wedded. With the church. Excuse me, sir. Why do you think that Jesus will come again? If you were the one, Brother Paul, will you come? 
when you were, your mother got you in the womb, and from, right from the womb, you're facing opposition. Do you know that they would have still married to death, if not God's grace? And the day you were to be born, you were not born in a house. You were born in the dining table of sheep and goats. But you hear me? How many of us know that the major is a dining table of sheep and goats? And right from death, Jesus began to face opposition. Is he about the Pharisees? Is he about the Sadducees? At the end, they killed him. And the Bible says it's coming again. I say that there is something in this world, no matter how wicked this world is, that will is making Jesus not to remove his eyes from the world for a second. Who is in this world? His wife. His bride. The church. The world may be wicked. The world may be evil. But as far as the church of God is in this world, Jesus cannot just be thinking about this world. You know, many of us have concluded in our hearts that the world is under the control of the devil. Your world can be under the control of the devil. My own world is under the control of Jesus. Because I am his bride. And it's waiting for the patient to see me. Do you know where you fell in love that time? Those of you who were married. You could go to your in-law house five times in a day and you will not be tired. Now you are getting tired because what you needed is in your house. Uh, Sister Lillian? Amen. Jesus keeps looking on it because the church is bright. It's been prepared. And as we are reading Revelation, I saw that the Bible said the readiness of the church will not be done by angels, will not be done by saints, will not be done by God himself. He said the church will make herself ready. But as I studied more on the church being the bride of Christ, I discovered that it's not about cathedrals. It's not about the church. The church we are talking about is not about what? Buildings. It's about people. When Paul was speaking to the people of Corinthians who were Christians, he said to them, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, he said, I am jealous of you with godly jealousy. He said, for I have espoused you. I have espoused you to one husband, so that I will present you as chaste virgin to Christ. When we say that the church is the bride of Christ, we are talking about every Christian. You that sit before me, and you are hearing from me now, you are the reason for which Jesus will come again. You are the one bride Jesus is coming to be celebrated with on the last day. I don't know what you have concluded about yourself. I don't know what others have made you feel about yourself. But this one thing I know is that if you are a Christian and you are baptized, you have been espoused, you have been betrothed, you have been given out in a covenant of marriage to Jesus. And when we say the bridegroom comes, it's not coming for kings. It's not coming for powerful men. It's coming for those who by the baptism and the experience of salvation of Christ has been what? Espoused to Christ. God say, I have espoused you. You have been espoused and betrothed to God. There is a day when Jesus will come and he will stretch out his hand and say, Bride, can we please move to the altar? Can we take our marriage vow? And can we continue forever in this romantic relationship? When you were baptized, something happened to you. As a church, we are celebrating your baptism uh, right that day. They gave you a white cloth. And they said to you with a white cloth, they say you have become a new creation. And you have clothed yourself in Christ. They say, see in this white garment, the outward sign of your Christian dignity. With your family and friends to help you, by word and by example, they say, bring this dignity or stain before Christ 
on the day of judgment. When they put that white cloth on your head, you were made new. You were made virgin. It doesn't matter your past. I feel like preaching a little. Can I talk to you? Did you notice that whom you are in God is not by your effort? We are not talking now. Let me preach a hard message. Your righteousness is not whether you commit sin or not. Your righteousness is because God made you righteous. But you didn't hear me. You have, did you hear me now? Yeah. Who you are in Christ is not a product of what you can do. It's a product of what God has made you. I am here to sensitize your heart that on the day of your baptism, you were made a virgin. You may have been born under the Shiran, the altar of a Shiran. does not matter. When you experience Christ and you became born again, the Bible says all things pass away and the new thing began. You are new. You are a virgin. Therefore, brethren, Jesus coming again to the world is to be wedded to every child of God who has been baptized and who has been born again of him and who has experienced his salvation. Can I tell you, brothers, that as far as you are a child of God, you are qualified for that wedding banquet. You didn't hear me. You are qualified for that wedding banquet. Every child of God, every believer, every baptized Christian, baptized Catholic, I mean to say, in specification, is qualified for that day. So when Jesus is coming, it's coming because why? By virtue of your salvation, you have been made a virgin. You have been made a virgin. God made you righteous. He took you from the wrong place you were standing and put you in the right place you will stand. That is righteousness. He reputed into you a nature that made you whom you are. There is a songwriter that says, I am what God says I am. The Bible speaking about us says, we are his children. He says, in fact, that is what we are. And he says, as he is in heaven, so we are. He said, but when he comes, we will be like him. Every child of God is qualified to be invited for this wedding banquet that we are talking about, that the bridegroom is coming for. I noted that as the Bible shows us in Matthew 25, even where all people were qualified, the Bible said those who stood up to go out for that banquet, the Bible said they were virgins. Why were they virgins? Because before now, in the book of Leviticus chapter 21, 19 to 15, the Lord gave it as a commandment that every high priest must marry a virgin. Jesus will only be wedded to virgins. He will only be wedded to virgins, not to Christians who have allowed themselves to prostitute. As I read that Leviticus, the Bible says, every woman that is defied by prostitution, the high priest cannot marry. A common priest can marry, but not Jesus, the high priest. Hebrews chapter 4, from verse 14. He says, since we have a high priest who has gone through the highest heaven, he says, let us hold on to the faith we profess. Jesus is the high priest. And in verse 15, he said, for the high priest that we have, it's not like the one that does not understand our weaknesses. If Jesus is a high priest, then Jesus will only marry virgin. And that is why we are facing on this matter that it is not those who have prostituted themselves who have allowed themselves to be contaminated. So this virgin, as we saw them today, came to meet Jesus. And as they came to meet Jesus, the Bible says... They were ten virgins. I noted that God was specific about the numbers. God wanted to let us know the numbers so that when God is choosing those who is choosing, 
you will know that when God comes to choose, God does not consider the multitude. Are in the Bible? That any time God comes to make a choice or to select his people, the Bible says God will select you. And I see that when God is talking about you, though that few of God is always very few. Do you remember that God, Adam and Eve, gave birth to only Cain and Abel? And Cain decided to kill Abel. If it were us, they would say, because they are only two, let's leave Cain now and forgive him. But I noticed that Jesus, God casted him away. In the world of Noah, as plenty as they are, when they became iniquitous, when God wanted to choose, how many men did God choose? Eight men, very few. When the city of Sodom and Gomorrah became very evil, two big nations, when God wanted to choose, he chose four. Anytime I read this scripture, I used to say, God help me. As God was carrying them to run for escape, one of them decided to be like others. And the Lord said, go and be like them. Three people from Federal Republic of Nigeria and Cameroon. Can you imagine what we are talking about now? Praise God now. Do you understand what I'm talking about now? I know that you get what I'm talking about. Only Joshua and Caleb enter the promised land out of 600,000 people. When God is talking about choosing a number, God does not, he's not always on the side of the multitude. He will choose very few. And I noted that God's view is always very few. A question I want to ask you, will you be among them? Will you be there? And so, the Bible says that they were all ten virgins. But as I look at these virgins, I noted some quality that they had that I want to bring up to you today. Number one, they were all virgins. In other words, they were all a spouse to God. They have received the sacrament. They were all born again. They were tongue-talking. They were prophecy-making. They were anointed men of God. They were charismatic, and they were already working in ministry. They were not ordinary people. All of them had these characteristics that they were charismatic. You know what? Whenever we are doing prayer meeting, when some of you come and come, when we give them the microphone, they say, I have come to join. Please let me tell your neighbor you have joined. You really say, say neighbor, you have come to join now. So you are qualified. But by virtue of that, they were qualified. I also noted that all of them have the desire to go and honor the bridegroom. They all came as we are here. They all came as we have given our life to Christ. They all came with their life. Nobody by first day. Charismatic. Sometimes I cherish you that in a cold like this, you are sitting and you are ready to sleep on the field. They came into various prayer meetings. Into various parishes. They came from everywhere. They all had the desire. I know that if I enter into your heart now, there is a quiet desire in your heart that that day when Jesus will come for that last supper, you will be there. Nobody will pray that, Lord, I don't want to be there. Is there anybody who does not want to be there? All of them wanted to be there. All of them wanted to be there. A characteristic that applies to all of them. And the Bible says, all of them also came. Now, another characteristic that I see about this lady is that they all carry their lamp. Nobody forgot his is a, a lamp. They carried it and they were coming. They came. They all received all they needed. And they came. And they all came in the midnight. Nobody came in the morning. One thing again I saw about this virgin as I was studying this scripture was that the Bible says when the bridegroom tarry, they all slumber and they sleep. Did you notice it? Don't praise the Lord now. They all slumber and they sleep. I feel like preaching. Do you know that sometimes a Christian can slumber? Do you know 
that sometimes a sleep, a quiet sleep has come across your way. Sometimes, Sister Lilia, you don't feel like continuing. It's normal. They hope slumber and they sleep. Sometimes you may not feel like praying. Especially now, they'll be telling you, Jesus will come, Jesus will come. He has never come. There are times that if you quietly ring in your heart, what if this matter is a scam? What if it is fake? What will be my stake? There are times that questions like this will come. But the Bible says that even with all these characteristics, the scripture says, says five were foolish and five were wise. There is something I need to say. When they introduced them, they introduced all of them together. But when they wanted to describe their weakness, they started with the foolish one. Did you notice it? Five were foolish, and he said five were wise. Now, I began to ask, what is that parameter that God used to make some groups some as foolish and some as wise? If they all had this parameter of being, you know, veggies, of wanting to meet the master, of carrying their lamp, of coming, and they all slobber, and everything applied to them. Why would God then say some are wise, wise and some are foolish? I started studying, and I noted that there was a quiet parameter, very quiet that it can be ignored, very quiet that as leader, you can be doing leadership, and you don't think about it. Very quiet, and as minister, as you are singing here with us, all array like angels, you may not, you will minister to the essence, and we keep clapping for you that you may not think about it. Something that is negligible. Can I speak to you, sister? What is not, does not matter here, is actually what will be matter arising in heaven. That on that day, sister angel writes, you come and they say, ah, you son, you were correct. You look everywhere. Say yes. And as you want to step in, Brother Peter will say, excuse me, there's a matter arising. How will you feel? It goes quiet. Bros, I you that come out here. I don't know what you want to do. No, come here. Amen? No, sir, I don't believe that again. Huh? And I will send me to revive our class, huh? I don't mind. Praise God now. I say praise God. I will go to Baba class. The Lord have mercy on me in Jesus' name. Then I pray. And I say in Jesus' name. Uh-huh. So, that when God was describing, and I noted that, the scripture quietly said that it was all year that they did not have in their lamp. All year. To keep their lamp burning. Eh? How can that make a man foolish and some wise? The Bible, it may be that they forgot. But as I was looking at oil, I also saw some quality about oil that oil as a parameter of judging these people was not external but was internal. Did you hear what I said? It was not a parameter. That your leaders could see. And they say, ah, brother Tim is a good Christian. You know that there are some parameters that church cannot see. Praise God now. All the others that we described, they were external. You could see it and say, ah, this lady, they all have this. But when it comes to oil, oil was to be put inside. It was quiet and it was internal. But yet, that was the parameter that heaven was holding onto. The parameter that heaven was holding onto strongly that could group these people as foolish and some as wise. That is something that you cannot narrowly pardon a man. As ah, they were rushing, so they forgot oil. Do you understand me? Oh, praise God. Praise God. I want you. Do you know that you can be doing Riaza for this conference? Riaza. That your quiet time you can forget. But it's a matter of that that God is using today as a parameter. You were rehearsing, rehearsing. But you forgot the source of Rehaza. And then Brother John was playing it to me. But for some time, he has not said, Baba, how far? 
But that was something God was holding on to. It was not eternal. It was what? It was not external. It was what? It was internal. It was something that the Bible says, because it was internal, it could be forgotten. It could be neglected. Brethren, can I preach to us? It appears that what will qualify us for this wedding banquet will be something that is negligible. With the something that the world will tell you, ah, don't worry, you'll be pardoned. With the something that, will, that your mind will tell you, and it's not, it's really not just a small tea. And noted that this was the attitude of Lord's wife. Say, let me just look. Now, after all, I've left the city. Let me look. After all, God gave me neck to turn. There was a political group that we wear. A very powerful man of God used to show this matter. When we say, brother, this is your immorality, deal with it. He will always say, God knows our body is not firewood. As that brother died last two years, I noted he died on top of a woman. Do you hear what I'm just saying? Do you hear what I say? I'm saying? Hear me, sir? What you can pardon yourself for, and the world can pardon you, and your prayer group leadership, and the church may not even reprimand you of. It appears that there is something like this that God will be holding on to. It can be a quiet pride. It can be a quiet negligence. It can be only stinginess. Give, you will not give. You will be the one that we announce, collect other people's money, you will not give. It can be something like that. Ah, he wants to marry me now. This is, we have taken me to my parents. And me, I'm going to have it's our parents. Then we can do everything quietly. It may be something like this. It may be something like tying a small charm in your house. And you use the picture of Jesus to cover it. It can be as quiet as that. The Bible says because it was very quiet, it could be forgotten. Yet, sir, this was what they needed to put their light on. This was what they needed to put their light on. This was what they needed to put their light on. One thing about this matter of oil was is that when they suddenly discovered that they did not have oil, I saw that oil is not something you can buy at a emergency. Did you saw you saw it see the way I'm seeing it? When they wake up and say, We don't have oil, what did they say? They say, Go and buy. Can I talk to us? There is a place all year are sold. All year we are talking about this quiet parameter. It's not gotten anywhere, anyhow. If you will get it, you need to travel far. I notice that the matter we are talking about now is a matter that if you neglect, when you realize it, you need to go back and start from somewhere. It may be small. It may be quiet. But it's heavy in the sight of God. How men judge does not most time agree with how God judge. God look at the interior, but man look at the external. They said, Go, search for it. Even when it was midnight, they needed to search. They needed to go back. Can I tell you today? Paraventure, as the Lord is speaking to you now. It is better, brother and sister, that you go back and search for where you threw away your oil. Don't let Jesus come. Because when Jesus comes, it might be too late. God is bringing this message so that we can stand up and go and search and get it back. Because the hour, the time, no man knows. And so the scripture says, they continue. They continue. And they continue. Amen. Praise the Lord now. Let me. They didn't know those foolish veggie. Maybe they forgot that long ago the Lord has commanded something about keeping your light on. In Exodus 27, from verse 20 to 21, the Lord said to Moses, Tell the children of Israel to be to live oil and bring it into my house. And he said, Aaron and his children must keep the lamp burning. And he said, this must be an ordinance for generations to come. Can I tell you, if by keeping your life burning, 
It is not a negotiation, it's a command. Aaron and his children must keep it, must. And he said it should be an ordinance. As I saw Jesus speak to us about light. And he need to keep our light on. In Matthew chapter 5, from verse 14 to 15, he said, Let your light so shine before men. He didn't say, please, may you let your light shine. In civil service, we may say you may wish to. But in God's service, it is a command. Let your light so shine before men, so that they will see your good work. And the Bible says, and they will glorify God. In Luke 15, 35, God also commanded, He said, see to it that the light within you did not become darkness. When God talked to us about keeping our lamp on, He talks it in a way of command. God does not negotiate it. God does not negotiate it. And that is actually what the church was saying when we were being baptized. Do you remember that they light up a candle and give you? This is what they say to you. They say, receive the light of Christ. This light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. You have been enlightened by Christ. You are to walk always as a child of a light. May you keep the flame of faith alive in your heart. When the Lord comes, may you go out to meet him with all the saints in the heavenly kingdom. The church gave you light. They, they gave it to you and said, keep it burning. It appears that when the church was talking to us, it was a command. I don't have time, but I need to rush. Now, all year that we are talking about appears to be something that we enable your lamp to burn. Something that we enable a Christian person to live a life of righteousness. I noted, brothers and sisters, that God, our God, the Almighty God we serve, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus that we are following, I noted that when God is dealing with us, when God is handling our matter, God handles us in and out. He's thorough in his dealing. Grace, God has made us righteous. Our lives were lit and they were given to us. But it is as if the light we are talking about is something that will enable us to continue in righteousness. Brother, do you notice that there is no how you can take a redneck, a lizard, from Nigeria to America, or either to Australia, and you start training the redneck until it will become a crocodile. Why? The gene in the lizard is not the gene of the crocodile. No matter where you, where you carry a goat to, a goat will always eat grass. America goat eat grass. They can be fresh or dry. All I know is that they eat grass. In the same way, there is nothing you can do to a sinner that will not make a sinner commit sin. You do you hear what I say? Some people will come, they say, this is my prayer group member, they are committing fornication. How can you stop them from committing fornication when you have not given them the gene that will do righteousness? There is a power that do righteousness. There is a power that overcomes sin. It appears that what God is looking at today is something that will enable us not to sin again. Is God talking to you? Did you hear what I say? I noted that if a man is born of God, there is a resemblance that God puts in you. The Bible speaking says, except a man be born again. You remember now? And as we began to go to First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, First Peter 31, verse 23, in my living Bible says, For you have a new life. That, in other Bible says, For you have been born again. But in living Bible says, For you have a new life. He said, The new life you have 
It's not the one that your parents gave you. For the life that your parents gave you will end, we fade away. He said your new life is eternal because it comes from the living word of God. I see, brothers and sisters, that if you were actually born again, there is something God is supposed to live in you. If you overlook that matter, whether you speak in tongues 27 hours, you will see do sin. Whether you go under the altar, sometimes I come to church, I see Christian under the altar. I don't know where they talk to that one. An altar is a sacred place. But in Abuja here, women, we enter under the altar, say, Jesus, help me, oh, help me, oh. I'll be looking at them. Amen. If you miss this thing, God is... Oh, God. How many sons do you have? Only one. If they carry that your son to hospital now, the DNA of your son will be linked to you. Your own will be linked to him, Abi. Why is it that God gave birth to us? We are not behaving like God. Because something is there that is not put in us. We were not quiet to receive it. As this virgin forgot their oil, we have forgotten it. We are in a hurry. What was that? First John chapter 3 verse 9 said, Whosoever that is born of God cannot continue to sin. He said, why? There is a seed of God in that man. As I read that Bible from various translations, I saw God say in the in Amplified, Amplified said, he cannot continue to make practice of sin. He said, why? He said, the spermatozoa of God is in that person. So the Bible says the DNA of God. It is this nature of God that makes men not commit sin. It is this nature of God that makes men to continue to do righteousness. No matter where they work, no matter where they do business, no matter who is the president, no matter who is winning in America or not, whether there is reception or not, it is this nature. The Titus chapter 2 call it the grace of God that brings salvation. He said that appears to us, say, it teaches us to say no to sin. There is a power God put in those he has begotten that they can say no to sin. I noted that when God will come to celebrate his wedding with us, God will be careful to see whether you carry that nature. And of course, you know what? If you do carry that nature, your continuance to do righteousness will end somewhere. When that cry will call, your light will have gone out. Did you hear me? How many people do we pray over and they prophesy accurate prophecy that were correct? But sooner or later, we see them end the drunkenness. So do they collect that nature? The nature of God. And as, as St. John, chapter 5, verse 18, was talking about the matter, he started it like this, say, and we know. Why did he say, and we know? Because the matter did not start from there. And we know that as many that are born of God cannot continue to sin. He said, why? He said, because they that are born of God keep themselves. There is a power for a Christian, even when you take him to Saudi Arabia to keep himself. There is a power for a Christian. When are you taking him to Sodom and Gomorrah to keep himself? What did you notice today? We say charismatic who are in a hurry to rush and work for God. They are not careful to look whether the oil in the lamp will carry them or not. They are not careful to note whether what they have in them now will carry them or not. Hear me, sir? If a man does not have that power to continue to do righteousness. I'm afraid that when the voice will ring, you will be disappointed. I'm afraid, even if in your family there are 27 reverend fathers, you are the only married person. When that voice will call, you will be disappointed. Can I preach to you? I noted that the whole the bridegroom call is a stride that will bring some expectations. Number one, it will bring us a surprising waking. You will be woken by surprise. You will look for, oh, who will hear my confession now? Father. Father himself is strongly somewhere. Did you hear me, somebody? Did you hear what I'm talking about now? Have you ever imagined the day rapture will come? 
and then God will start from Father. I would you if I said, Behold the Lamb of God. Him is no longer there. Who do you, will you long, run to? And do you hear what I'm talking about now? Do you hear what I'm talking about now? It will be a surprising call that no man will be prepared for. And so God is saying, it is better we prepare for this matter now. It is better that we stop deceiving ourselves and look at it. Look at the others. They say, after Life in the Spirit Seminar, they say, stay one year in uh, post Life in the Spirit Seminar. People are complaining. We want to go to ministry. We want to go. Nobody wants to say whether I carry that thing or not. There are many charismatic that have been swallowed by the world. And the world is still swallowing. There are many believers that have been swallowed. Those whom we came in together, only few are standing. And I noted that those that are standing are those who were careful to collect that nature. Is there oil in your lab? Are you not just working with corporate anointing? What is it that you pray when it assesses us gather like this in your house? When you fall on your bed, it's like an elephant has fallen. Why? Why is it that you, anyway you are in church, you hold your hand like this, and you are like an angel, but in your office you are not there? Why? Why is there no difference between you and them? I discover, brethren, that God, when he comes, will be looking for something quiet. He will be looking for whether he left a nature on you or not. And I noted that getting the nature of God, you don't get it at an emergency search. Amen? God has a process. So the wise said, he said, please, we collected lamp, collected sacraments. Yeah? Did you hear me? We collected candle and white cloth. But we are careful to collect nature. We were careful to collect DNA. We were careful to collect the spermatozoa. They say, we cannot give you our own because, of course, this thing cannot be shared. They say, go to those. Did you hear me? I noted that if actually Christ is coming now and you don't have it, it may be difficult. Did you get what I'm saying? So it is better we prepare now. And the Bible says they went up. But as they kept searching... How do we get this matter of life correct? Get such it. Such it. How do we get enablement to do righteousness? The Bible says because God is a time keeping God, the door was locked. I'm just praying that door will not be locked against me. I'm just praying that door will not be locked against you. I'm just praying that as we sit before God, God will put that consciousness in your heart to do the needful so that the door will not be locked. And the Bible says, when they got the lab, they were sweating. <laughs> and they came, the door was closed, and they know, Master, Master, with this way now, the veggies. Did you notice that Christians today, they are, they are quick to introduce their, their qualification. As I was coming in just now, they still were saying, I should not go up. Huh? And they say, who am I? They say, I say, call the committee chairman. They say, tell us, you don't have a tag. Even when I was telling them, I was one of the speakers. They say, no, you don't have a tag, go back. That is how it will be, oh. You don't know? That is how it will be. They say, I am the elder sister chairman. They say, thank you. Stay there. They say, you should come and catch me. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't have much time. We need to go. I just want to tell us, brothers, that when the, this all said, I don't know you. Eh? I do not. Eh? How will God say, I don't know you? Did he not see me in the mass? Praise God now. How many times did I eat the body and drank the blood and say, I don't know you? I noted that there are many Christians today who have said, God, you are my father. And God is asking Niger, who is this person? He says, she said, you are the father. Let me know about this one now. You do you understand what I'm talking about now? It is something material. Brothers, let me tell you something that will help you. This bridegroom that we are expecting, when he came before, 
Eh? He came as a lamb. But when he's coming back, this is why we are expecting him. He's coming as a lion of the tribe of Judah. Can I tell you? He's not coming to defend men. He's coming to kill those who are his enemy, but the sword from his mouth. And who are those that are his enemy? Those that does not carry this oil in their what? In their lamp. When he came before, he came begging men and said, Man, follow me, I will make you. But I see that when he's coming again, he's coming to cast away men. He's coming to tell us, Go away. I do not know you. He came as an intercessor, brethren, and has been begging God, God, please have mercy. But when he will come, he's coming like a judge. And when he comes as a judge, he's coming to condemn men. He came to introduce grace and remove the law. But he will come again to remove grace and introduce an eye for an eye and a, a tooth for a tooth. He will come and enforce that the soul that sinned, he shall die. When he came before, he came and he was born in an humble way. But he's coming with the sword of angel to administer his justice. Don't think, brother, that this matter is he not Jesus. He's a merciful God now. He came with love. But this time, he's coming with a sword in his mouth to execute judgment. Don't be caught up. As I round up this message as we want to pray, I want to tell you that this opportunity of getting this oil in your lamp, if you miss it, it's not an opportunity you can call back. It's not an opportunity that you can say, let me quickly get back. No, sir. Those who lost it will not get it back. And I see that it is important that today, today, like the Bible says, if you hear the voice of the Lord, you need not to harden your heart. You need to respond with energy. We don't need to play with this matter. We don't need to post on this matter. We don't need to rationalize or see blame. We need to respond to this matter. The question I want to ask you, brethren, leader says, minister second, do you have the oil? If yes, when the trumpet sound now, will you be taken? The best truth a man can tell himself, they can never tell, is the truth to tell yourself. And notice that the world is not making us tell ourselves the truth. When Jesus knock now, will you be taken? ADSC chairman, ADSC wife, chairman's wife, vice chairman, all kind of iri iri titles. When Jesus knock now, you organize a conference, will you be taken? If this is God's way of wrapping us up, will you be there? If this is God's way of wrapping us up, will you be there, brethren? We need to respond to this matter. It's a call that we cannot overlook. We are quick to begin to look at time, but I noted that if you miss this matter, eternity has no time. If you miss this matter, there is a trouble that no one can question. I want us to rise on our feet. Can you just give me a microphone, sir? Maybe like two. Just give me two microphones. Where, where are my people? I just want us to rise on our feet. I want us to respond to this matter. I want us to respond to this matter quickly. I want us to respond to this matter. I just want to sing a song. And as I'm singing this song, if you are not sure that you collected that thing, you need to come before the altar of God, though it's not me. You need to come here and say, God, I am co I've come to search for it. Give me that oil oh yeah, again. In case, as God is talking to you now, you are not sure. You need to rush to the altar of God. I know that when messages like this are preached, people are ashamed. They say, hey, what will people say? How will they say me a coordinator? How will they see me a dinner coordinator? How will they see me a sister singer, a sister prayer warrior, a sister teacher? But I noted that salvation is something that you must pursue with the whole of your heart. I will be singing. If you are not sure, run to the altar of God and beg God to give you this light again. In case you are here, you are not evil, you are not evil, you have not even started. 
you see, come and beg God for this what? Or here again. Can you close your eyes now? Can you close your eyes? I won't take time to pray, Lord. I just want us to respond. And as we respond, we'll come. What I mean is, if you are not shocked, you may need to come before the altar of God. And you need to beg God. Say, Father, give me this oil. I'm not looking at somebody. I want to sing the way I can sing. Amen. Amen. Busy serving the Lord. Busy praying for all men. Busy sweeping the hall. In the house of the Lord. Prophesying and preaching. Singing, clapping and dancing. Do you really know the Lord? Or oh, you are just working for Him? Do you really know the Lord God? Or oh, you are just working for Him? How is your inner man? How is your inner man? How is your prayer life? How much of the word of God do you have in your heart? Or oh, you are just working for Him? In the house of the Lord, there are many kinds of vessels. What some peace or not the Lord, some bring God not to him. God is looking for a vessel that we all know him always. Do you really know the Lord? Or you are just working for him? Do you really know the Lord God? Or you are just working for Him? How is your inner man? How is your inner man? How is your prayer life? How much of the word of God do you have in your heart? Or you are just working for Him? I want you to begin to pray. I want you to pray to God as you come before Him. I want you to beg Him and say, Lord, give me this nature. Give me this nature. Give it to me, Lord. I can't stay beyond now without you this nature. Where this wedding shall be over. I know there will be another wedding. We are going to where the I know that there will be another one. On the greatest reward. I don't want to miss out of it. My brothers will I don't there. want to miss out of it. When this world is not a We are going to the We are going to the world. I'm not a say. On the greatest reward. Help me. My sister. I need that nature. I need I that oil. I don't want my lamp to go. We are going to a I day. don't want my lamp to go. I don't want my lamp to go. My sisters, if you don't let me know, why this way? If it be this way, we are going to a day. Let me know. Begin to pray. My brother, Father. Give me what that nature. Give me that thing. Put it in my life. We are going to put it in my life. On that ground. Put it in my life. My Give me that nature. Why I do not want to know. I do not want to do it again. Don't be a pass away on that day. It doesn't matter, Lord. The essence of which I have gone. But it doesn't matter, Lord, whether I'm in the school or not. It doesn't matter, Lord, whether I'm recognized or not. I am begging, Lord. Get back to me again. Correct this matter in my life. Correct this matter in my life. Because I don't want to spend eternity in hell. I don't want to spend eternity. What are the problems? I want to participate. Hallelujah. that worthy banquet. I want to participate. Is that worthy banquet? I don't want to 
as you pray. Amen. You remain there, we'll be praying generally. Maybe see what may we to minister to you as you stay there. But you will join us, continue with us in prayer. But then I want us to pray. It's a prayer meeting. Short prayer point to go. We want to pray for ourselves. We want to say, Lord, in this conference, change my focus. Change my focus from the temporal to eternity. Say, in this conference, remove my eyes. In this conference, remove my eyes from those things that are, does not matter. Close my eyes to be focused on you again. Open your mouth and pray for yourself. Open your mouth and pray for yourself. Ask God to change your focus. 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 Say Lord, from the unnecessary, from the temporary, from the things that do not matter, change my focus. Don't need to yourself again. Don't need to yourself again. Let me see you clearly. Let me see you openly. Let me see you closely. Feel my eyes. My mind, my focus, back to tell you, back to eternity, make me conscious of my year of death. Lord, you focus me. Separate me from it. Separate me from it. As from today. As from today. Connect me about to your truth. Connect me Say, Father. Father. Whatever is telling me lies. Whatever is telling me lies. Telling me it is well. Telling me it is well. When it is not well. When it is not well. Telling me it is now. When there is a hereafter. Say, Father. Father. Separate me from death. Connect me to your truth. Connect me to your so your mind and let's pray to God. Connect me to your truth. But as of today, connect me to your truth. As of today, the fear of you they will not deceive you any longer. As of today, they will not deceive you any longer. The lies of the world. The lies of the world. The lies of the devil. The lies of wickedness. The lies of the world. We cannot be seen in the Connect me to your truth. Connect me to your truth. Connect me to your truth. Let your word make meaning. Let your word Let the world make meaning. Let the world make meaning. Let your truth prevail in my life. Let your truth prevail in my life. Let your truth prevail in my life. Ask me. 